Okay, still on AC 2.3, sociological theories. But this time we're going to look at the sociological theory, which is that of Karl Marx, Marxism. We'll evaluate the theory and then we we'll, might have a look at how that theory may have informed some policies regarding crime and punishment. So just as an introduction to Marxism and Karl Marx, we know that sociological theories of crime are saying that social factors play a part in crime. They generally talk about the disadvantaged social class as being a primary cause of crime and that criminal behaviour begins in youth. So what they're saying is crime is largely a result of unfavourable conditions in a community such as unemployment, single parent families, poor housing, etc, etc. So we're looking at Marxism in this presentation and Marxism is a structural theory. It's looking at the structure of society and basically Marxism is saying that the unequal structure of a capitalist society shapes criminal behaviour. So without further ado, let's have a look at that in more depth. So, Karl Marx, 1818 to 1883. His critical theories about society, economics and politics are collectively known as Marxism. And his key idea that is that basically capitalist society is divided into two classes. The ruling class which he calls the bourgeoisie. Again, in the exam, using technical terms will get you more marks. So use the word bourgeoisie. Uh, the bourgeoisie, the ruling class, they own the businesses, the banks, the land, etc., which Marx refers to as the means of production. They are the owners of everything. And underneath the bourgeoisie, such as this lot, you've got the working class or the proletariat. Again, use that word proletariat. Those are the people that work for the bourgeoisie, and Marx argues that the capitalists, the bourgeoisie, exploit the proletariat to make a profit. So this group here, the bourgeoisie, the upper classes, the ones that own the land, that own the businesses, exploit this group, the working class, the, um, the ones that labour in their factories, that labour for them, and the bourgeoisie get rich on the work of the proletariat who remain relatively poor. Now there's a link here, um, obviously if you're watching this on my YouTube channel uh, you won't be able to use the link but if you google Marxism in a minute there's a very good YouTube um, clip that you can watch which will help you. So I'd recommend that to you. Moving on. So. Marxist views of crime and the law have three distinct elements. First element is that capitalism causes crime. And again, I'm going to look at each of these three in more detail as we go through. So Marx argues that the capitalist society causes crime to happen. At the same time, Marx also argues that the lawmaking of society and its enforcement are biased. And it won't be any surprise to you to say that it's biased against the proletariat and biased pro the bourgeoisie. And finally, the third element of Marxism as regards criminology is that crime and law perform ideological functions. And we'll look into that in a little more detail in a minute. So let's look at that first one, the idea that capitalism causes crime. So Marx would argue that in a capitalist society, crime is inevitable. Crime, uh, capitalism is criminogenic. It's a good word that, use it if you can. Criminogenic is a crime causing system. Why is that the case? Well, that's because the fact that the working class, the proletariat are exploited, drives people into poverty. And because they're in poverty, what that means is crime is the only way to survive. So in order to survive, because you're poor, you have to commit crime. Interestingly, baby food is the most shoplifted item in this country, which might say something about the poverty that people are encountering and the need to steal to feed, particularly a young child. Also linked to this idea that crime is ine inevitable in a capitalist society is the fact that capitalism 
continually pushes consumer goods at people through advertising. So people are under pressure to conform to have the goods that are advertised through capitalism, and that results in crimes of theft to obtain the goods that are being advertised. So there we have a sort of a materialistic, let's all go and shop, we need stuff. That's what we want in a capitalist society. And furthermore, this inequality between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat causes feelings of alienation amongst the proletariat and frustration, which then results in crimes such as violence and vandalism. So the frustration felt by the proletariat to their lot in life leaves them to be frustrated, alienated, and that results in violence, vandalism, etc. So rioting, as we can see here in the uh, London riots uh, within the last couple of years. Also, Marxism argues, capitalism causes crime among the capitalists themselves, because capitalism promotes greed. And what this then encourages is capitalists to commit corporate crimes, white collar crimes, such as tax evasion, breaking health and safety laws, to gain an advantage, to gain more money, to produce more stuff and to become richer. So you could look at this, um, this newspaper headline about the tax avoiders such as Amazon, Starbucks and Google that were in trouble um, a few years ago about the fact they didn't pay tax. When we get to the second element of Marxism, which is the idea that law and making and enforcement are biased, that is looking at the fact that sociologists such as William Shambly argue that laws are made to protect private property, which mainly is owned by the rich. So the laws are biased towards the bourgeoisie because there are laws against the homeless squatting in empty houses. But of course, there's no laws against the rich owning several houses. So for instance, if we look at this map here, which looks at the rate of homelessness ranked by local authority, so obviously the, um, the highest, the, the blackest is where the homelessness is, all in London. And if we look down towards Cornwall, fourth highest, and where we're looking down where we are in sort of Devon, which is sort of mid range, and then compare that, look particularly at Cornwall and London, then compare that with the amount of second homes we've got. Well, look at where all those second homes are. So really interesting that there's high levels of homelessness in Cornwall, but also high levels of people owning second homes. Um, also, there's very few laws that challenge the unequal distribution of wealth. In a capitalist society, there are no laws that talk about things being equal and wealth being distributed evenly. And if you look at this uh, very interesting uh, stat, talking about uneven distribution of wealth, in America, if US land were divided uh, like the US wealth was, 1% of Americans would own this amount of land 9% would own this amount of land, 30 would own this, 20 would own this, and 40% would own the tiny little red dot over here, which looks that massive inequality of the distribution of wealth within a capitalist society such as America. And the same would apply to us in the UK. Carrying on with this theme that lawmaking and enforcement are biased, Marxism also argues that the law is enforced selectively. It's selective against the working class, the proletariat, but not against the upper classes, the bourgeoisie. So if it's white collar and corporate crime, which is much more likely to be uh, committed by the bourgeoisie, it's much less likely to be prosecuted than working class street crimes, for want of a better world, word. The poor, in a, a Marxist argue, are punished more harshly than the rich for crimes. So, for instance, if you want to stat, out of 200 com companies who've broken safety laws, the sociologist Carson found that only three were prosecuted. And despite the large numbers of death at work caused by employers' negligence, there was only one successful prosecution of a UK firm for corporate homicide. That would seem to indicate that the law is unfairly stacked against the proletariat and for the bourgeoisie. 
And it would be true to say that corporate crime is often punished less severely, often with punishments more like big fines rather than jail sentences. So law enforcement favours the rich. Um, we can look at this with another example of things like benefit fraud, which attracts prosecution and prison, yet tax fraudsters really get taken to court and prosecuted. So here is the one time um, chance of the exchequer saying a welfare cheats like a mugger who robs you on the street. These adverts, things like we're closing in on benefit thieves with the help of hundreds of calls to our hotline. We've got the spill the beans on benefits frauds. It's your money they're stealing. And yet very little is done for people who prosecute uh, such a, yeah, who, who avoid tax, such as Gary Barlow, Jimmy Carr or Starbucks. So an uneven distribution in how crime is um, uh, viewed. So more stats for you. You know, if we take um, <laughs> and this is a really good one. OK, if you look at uh, benefit fraud, it's at one point two billion. If you look at benefits over payments, so people get too much, it's at 1.4 billion. And if it's benefits unclaimed, 16 billion. So in fact, the benefits office is in the in the black because 16 billion is unclaimed, and the they've been conned out of what 2.6 billion. Tax avoided, evaded, and uncollected is 30 billion. Okay. Um, and if we go for the tax avoided, evaded, uncollected by the tax justice and PCS estimate, it's more like 120 billion. And that would show the massive discrepancy between the, bourgeois, uh, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat down here. And here are some examples of uh, this was the 12 tax dodges of Christmas that I found. It's Christmas time as I recorded this, so uh, you've got, you can have a look through this at your leisure. But it looks at various big companies that haven't paid tax over many years. So Apple, Topshop, Topman, Boots, Ikea, eBay, etc, etc. So again, uh, big multinational countries avoiding tax, paying less tax than we all do, us workers. If we then look at the ideological functions of crime and law, that third category, Marxists argue that ideas about crime and the law are an ideology. In other words, it's a set of ideas that conceal the fact that capitalist society is unequal, it's unfair. For example, selective enforcement makes it look as if crime is the fault of the working class. So this then encourages workers to blame working class criminals for their problems rather than capitalism itself. So the idea is it deflects attention away from the root cause of the, of the problem, which is capitalism itself, and deflects onto working class criminals such as benefit cheats, benefit frauds, etc, etc. Away from that big picture, which is all the tax evaders, the fact that capitalism is unfair. So the attention is shifted away from much more serious ruling class crimes, as I demonstrated in that previous slide. And what Marx argues is that these ideas, what they do is they encourage the working class to accept capitalism, which obviously doesn't do them any good, instead of replacing it with a more equal society, which would do them some good. So I thought this um, cartoon was quite interesting. You know, if you get poor, you get caught with drugs, it's a crime and you get locked up. But if you're rich, you get caught with drugs, you're a celebrity, it's a scandal and off they go to rehab. You know, very, very often don't do any time whatsoever, an unequal society. And I think it's really important to have um, a case study of the sort of issues that Marxism would talk about. And I've chosen the Bhopal disaster, which occurred in December the 2nd, 1984. Now, this link here will take you to a really good dramatization of the Bhopal, Bhopal disaster. Um, it's, it's acted out, it's, it, it's not a documentary, but it gets over the idea really well. But you can find numerous other documentaries on YouTube if you so wish. But I'm gonna take you through a, a little bit about the Bhopal disaster to give you a feeling for how, um, how this could be interpreted in a market way. So in December the 3rd 1984 
in Bhopal in India, 45 tonnes of dangerous gas, methyl, isocy methyl isocyanate, escaped from an insecticide plant that was owned by an Indian subsidiary of a big American firm called Union Carbide. So the firm that owned this plant was an American firm, firm called Union Carbide, a multinational com company. Uh, the gas, when it escaped, drifted, up, drifted over a really densely populated neighbourhood which built up around the plant and it killed thousands of people immediately and created a massive panic as tens of thousands of others attempted to flee Bhopal. Now the final death toll is estimated to be between 15,000 and 20,000 people. It's the worst industrial accident ever. Also, some half a million survivors have suffered respiratory problems such as eye irritation, blindness, other illnesses resulting from the exposure to toxic gas. Many of those people who have suffered have been awarded compensation, but the compensation is merely a few hundred dollars. Now, investigations later established that the cause for the leak was the substandard operating and safety procedures at the understaffed plant that led to the catastrophe. So basically, it was negligence that led to the, um, the disaster. And in 1998, the factory site was actually turned over to the Indian state of Madhya Pradesh. So it was made, um, it was turned over to the Indian government. In the early 21st century, there's still more than 400 tonnes of industrial waste present on the site. Despite continued protests and attempts at bringing those responsible to court, the Dow Chemical Company, which bought out Union Carbide in 2001, has never been taken to court. The Indian government hasn't cleaned the site. We've got soil and water contamination in the area, and that's still being blamed for chronic health problems and high instances of birth defects in the area's inhabitants. In 2004, the Indian Supreme Court ordered the state to supply clean drinking water to the residents of Nepal because the groundwater was completely contaminated. And finally, in 2010, several former executives of Union Carbide's Indian subsidiary, notice all of whom were Indian citizens, were convicted by a Bhopal court of negligence in the disaster. Notice that no Americans, those who own the company, the, the real owners, have ever been prosecuted or convicted. They were prosecuted, but they haven't been convicted. So, why did Union Carbide set up that Bhopal plant in India and not America? Well, the answer is because the pollution controls were less rigid in India than the USA. So, you could argue the Indian government has something to blame there, but you could argue that the USA gov um, state were also a uh, USA company were also negligent in sort of allowing it to um, allowing it to go. So the Indian state was obviously supporting developments in the interests of allowing profits to be made. So what would Marxists say about this? Well, they'd point out that none of the company's USA directors have been convicted of negligence, despite that massive death toll. And Marxists would argue that the company owners are the true criminals in this scenario, not um, those uh, the people that have been prosecuted. So that gives you a good idea of corporate negligence and how you can argue this from a Marxist perspective. So when it comes to evaluating the effectiveness of Marxism, its strengths, well, it provides an explanation for crime that covers all social classes and also a variety of offences. It also highlights the impact of selective law enforcement and how white collar crime is under policed. So two really good strengths there. And it also demonstrates how the law reflects differences in power between the social classes and how inequality in society could lead to criminal behaviour. So again, another good strength there. When we get on to its limitations, there are a few, because it focuses Marxism on class and largely ignores the relationship between crime and other inequalities such as gender or ethnicity, which are swept aside by Marxism to some extent. It also overpredicts the amount of crime in working class communities. I mean, 
It would be not all poor people commit crime, and Marxism sort of implies that they will. And again, it would also be true to say that not all capitalist societies have high crime rates, which Marxism sees as being inevitable. So Japan and Switzerland have considerably lower crime rates than the USA, for instance. And prosecutions for corporate crime do occur. So, for instance, you can look at the Wolf of Wall Street as an example. So if we're looking at how Marxism may inform policy development for our final slide, well, Marxist views will, to some extent, inform any policy that's trying to address the divide between rich and poor, make it, you know, make it less. So any structural changes within society that are tackling things like discrimination, inequality of opportunity, unfairness of rewards, would be welcomed by Marxists, along with the provision of good jobs and housing for all. Also, Marxist was, Marxism would support any policy that places the ownership of business with the state and not private companies. So, um, you know, they would not um, support privatising things like the NHS. And here we see uh, the PCS, which is the um, part of the uh, justice system, uh, those people that work with law centres, etc. There was a big campaign to stop that being privatised. And again, Marxists certainly were not um, support from a criminological point of view, private prisons or probation companies, which are both, I think it would be true to say, not been very successful. And you can look, if you want more information on private prisons or probation companies, particularly um, community rehabilitation companies, CRCs, which are private probation companies, which the government is trying to get rid of at the moment because they've been such an unmitigated disaster, um, there's more grist to the mill for Marxism. That's Marxism, guys. I hope you found that useful, and I'll see you soon for another presentation. Goodbye.